if you, if you have an empty seat beside you, would you please raise your hand? Okay. We have some right here at the front and two right here on the front row, and then the choir section is always open. We won't be singing until the afternoon, so just come right on up and sit in the choir loft, if you will. What a great day. What a way for us to get started here. We're so glad you're here and learning so much. Um, I like to hear the practical stuff, don't you? The practical stuff. The good stuff. We're ready for our next presenter. Jennifer was here with us a few years ago. I don't remember how many years ago it was right now. And if you've been up to the State Botanical Garden in Athens, perhaps you saw her there. Or you heard one of her presentations there, or some of her handiwork at the Botanical Garden there. But we're so glad that she's here with us today, and she's going to be talking about bog gardening. What we It's fascinating. Just fascinating to me. Um, so come on in. Maybe there's two separated right there on the second row. Okay, that'd be great if Miss Virginia's going to go around the corner. Wonderful. I hope you've had a chance to visit plant vendors and look at the beautiful books out there and been in the conservatory, conservatory to see our friend Linda's artwork and met some new friends. That's what I hope you've done today already. So we're glad you're here, and Jennifer Seska with the University of Georgia at the State Botanical Garden is our next speaker. I really appreciated the invitation. I was honored to be asked to come down and talk about future plans. Um, I've been at the Botanical Garden for 20 years this month, and um, Reco recovery, conservation, education with pitcher plants has been our a main project for all those 20 years. Because I'm going to say it right out loud, pitcher plants are very sexy. <laughs> I just said it and most of you blush, I saw it. Okay. Um, you need to know that this is not the Jennifer Show. I work with amazing people. Ann Shank is our Director of Education and she helps take this all this information from science and put it into a format that was accessible. And then I work with Jim and Heather and Linda in the conservation program at the State Botanical Garden in Athens. You should come. It's free. It's your garden. We're the state garden. So come see us. Um, in your notes are all the details. And also this information is up on the web. Um, so let me do some storytelling and lay in the methods why I'm going to teach you how to fish. And then building the bog will be intuitive. Know that everything I've learned, I've learned from the bog fathers. Tom Patrick on the left, DNR botanist, Ron Biederman, he can root a pencil, he's from the Atlanta Botanical Garden. And he is, um, has a lifelong dedication to uh, the conservation of carnivorous plants worldwide. His plant knowledge is epic, doesn't matter what plant family you bring up, native, non-native, he's got it. Um, and the Atlanta Botanical Garden is internationally recognized as the repository when pitcher plants are poached from the wild. And they're caught flying out of Atlanta Airport, and it happened last year. Um, those rescued plants go back to the Atlanta Botanical Garden to be nurtured and, and um, cared for. So those are the bog fathers. So we're talking about pitcher plants. How many of you know pitcher plants? Yay! How many of you have been to a pitcher plant bog? Wonderful! Do you ever see them along roadsides? You still do? In Florida. Interesting. Okay. So we're talking about wet wildflower meadows that were once ex huge expanses as far as the eye can see. Land in Georgia south of the fall line that is burned for quail plantation like this Dixie plantation um, in Thomasville, Georgia. These are where you find these amazing habitats. And you can put this in your garden and you could even do all kinds of container gardens with a pitcher plant in it. Now, I thought about passing this around. It's a little heavy because the soil is really dense. What do y'all think? Does it give you a chance to feel the pitcher plant? Put your finger inside there. And if you stay too long, it'll start chewing. So be careful. <laughs> do they chew? No. It's not an active kind of, of eating. It's passive. They trap their prey. See? They're sexy. They tell stories. What a great hook to get people to pay attention to plants. 
I'm going to pass this around. If this does not come back to me, I will hunt you down like the dog that you are. <laughs> Seriously, I borrowed this from my colleague, Heather Alley, and um, it must come back. There are sedges that are dormant inside. Please don't weed it, because those could be little baby seedlings of, of wonderful things coming up. And uh, the pitcher plant might pee on you because there's water inside. That's okay. That's a blessing, a bog blessing. inside and feel the hairs that are inside. The hairs are used for trapping. This is a wet wildflower meadow up in North Georgia. It is a coastal plain bog that was stuck back in time up in North Georgia. It's protected by the Nature Conservancy. Notice how open. Notice the slight slope. These are things you're going to be recreating in your garden. Look at the wildflowers. This is a totally recreated garden. This is not a natural bog. This was one of the Ron Dieterman, I tell you, you can root a pencil, um, gardens. Amazing. Wonderful plants, great for storytelling, great for your cocktail party in your garden. You're walking around. Let me tell you about those windows on the back of the pitcher plant. The insect flies in there, thinks it can get out. He gets trapped in the belly of the pitcher plant and slowly and horribly digested. See, you could be doing this with your glass of wine in your garden, with your bog garden, in full sun. Now, what is a pitcher plant? We're talking pitcher, like a pitcher of tea, not picture. It's got a hood. What does the hood do? It keeps rainwater out, right? There are nectar glands around the lip to draw prey, right? There's some are actually fragrant. The red pitcher plant is sweet. They call it the sweet pitcher plant because it smells good. The tube is a trap. Often there are downward pointing hairs. The more the insect struggles, the more they get worked down to the bottom and the belly of the pitcher plant has enzymes just like your stomach where the insects are slowly and horribly digested over time. They have found frogs in the bellies of pitcher plants and salamanders. I think it would, you know, you just want to say, stand up. You know, you're not drowning. The purple pitcher plant that we're passing around actually uses um, drowning to trap its prey. The mouth is open like a big mouth frog, right? And rainwater fills those pitchers. So if you have that in your garden, you want to keep the pitchers in there. You know how insects can dance on the water? Surface tension, you have to go home and do the paper clip on the water. Drop a little soap in there and this paper clip falls. Purple pitcher plants have their own surfactant, a soap, that helps them to drown their prey. I mean, we're talking about some wonderful stories of adaptation, clever tricks, great storytelling plants. This is the yellow pitcher plant. This is the green pitcher plant. It's a federally endangered plant because of loss of habitat. That is the flower. They flower early, early spring before the new flush of pitchers come out. Those are the petals hanging down, the large umbrella-shaped female structure, and then it has little bitty stamens that fall off. Ah, okay, you didn't laugh. <laughs> the little bitty male parts fall off. You didn't laugh. <laughs> this frog is not being slowly and horribly digested in the yellow pitcher plant. It's actually utilizing the trap to get insects, which I think is, and he's adorable. <laughs> so you need to know that most people work with plants because we're so tender-hearted. We love the animals too much. That's why we work with the plants. Uh, yes. Um, this is the common plant that you would see down here, and they can be hip high with a mouth that's about four inches open. White top pitcher plant, gorgeous, also would be in South Georgia. We will talk about this later, but it was poached from the wild to extinction in Georgia. Notice those hairs? It's the only species that puts up a fall flush of pitchers in the, in the fall, a fall flush in the fall, for catching migrating moths, reflecting off the moonlight. Are we talking romance in the bog here? These things are so cleverly adapted. And if you cite this in your garden for backlighting, all right, a little Daryl, Daryl Morrison trick, luminosity he calls it. He's a landscape designer at Native Plants then they look like stained glass windows. So you get that luminosity, right? I'm, I'm saying. And you can do it in a pot. You don't have to build a bog, but we're gonna tell you how. This is hooded, also all over the coastal plain and pitcher plant bogs. And this is purple, and there's a mountain form and a coastal plain form. And this is the big mouth frog that drowns its prey. And this is the one we're passing around, and you will return it to me, again. okay. You need to know about this. There's a whole world of insects that live inside pitcher plants. And this is from research from Dr. Debbie Falkertz of Auburn. She's wonderful. So there are paper wasps. There are eczema moths. They look like 
Holstein cows? Is that the right cow? The black and white cow? Okay, good. Um, you take the moth out and you open your hand and it goes whoop, like a you know like those Russian cats that jump into the vase in the circus. That's what the moths are. You got the analogy. It's good. Okay. Um, so there's a whole ecosystem inside pitcher plants, and we have all this up on the web on a, on our Edson website. More great storytelling. You can get in there and look for those critters. You can do pitcher plant autopsies and see what they've been eating. So these come from pitcher plant bogs. You need to understand a bog if you're going to understand how to place this in your garden. So this again is Dixie Plantation. This is what early European settlers would have seen with widely spaced longleaf pine habitat and where there's a rock layer and a spring seep or a confluence of streams, the water's flowing across the top and you have wet, a wet wildflower meadow. So the bog that we're going to be creating in our bog displays is this kind of wet wildflower meadow. So there are lots of kinds of wetlands. We're not talking about fens, we're not talking about bacosans, we're not talking about mountain bogs in the North Georgia mountains. This is a special kind of wet wildflower habitat. That also means that the water is flowing in and out of the site. So it's not a stagnant habitat. That is gorgeous right there. This is a totally recreated Ron Dieterman bog near the fall line. Wonderful pitcher plants and wildflowers and you can do this in your garden. And you can put all these lovelies, all these companion plants, including sundews, which are like inside out stomachs. What fun that is, right? And um, they're just really great plants. The terrestrial orchids, you can't quite have yet, but they are coming through tissue culture through the Atlanta Botanical Garden. You will be able to have them in your garden, but not quite yet. They're still working out the science. A lot of bogs you see are on roadsides, power lines. You just see a few of those yellows popping up. They can dry out to the point of cracked soil. These plants are tough. They will persist. Pitcher plants can be over 150 years old. They are long-lived perennials. This is a great way to maintain your bog garden. Burning it is oh, so much fun. I got to do this yesterday at the garden. Wet down your grass. Bermuda, Shamruda, you know. Wet that down and just light a little torch and that cleans up your bog and it's the best way. Or you could mow it in the winter another way. If you don't, if you created a, an, a, the wild bogs need fire to keep the shrubs out. Otherwise, the succession comes and it, we lose the bog. This is a mountain bog, and beavers used to keep these bogs open, and we have to go in there and make like beavers. This is a site we've been working on for 20 years. And that's the sphagnum mat that we started with. Wild bogs have sphagnum moss, and you can get sphagnum moss. Um, a little pinch will go a long, long way. Um, might be that's maybe the trickiest part it's not essential if you're making a bog garden a pitcher plant without sunlight a pitcher plant with sunlight they need full sun as much sun as you can possibly give them if you can only give them half day give them afternoon sun okay part of gardening with pitcher plants is that you become a conservation biologist because you're telling the story of a really cool plant a really cool plant system education is essential these are heritage plants of Georgia in the southeast. These are very special. And just by growing them and loving them and telling your, their story, you are helping their survival. And that is wonderful. I encourage gardening with pitcher plants. Things that do hurt pitcher plants, they are collected, the pitchers are collected in, um, to the point of over harvesting. This happens to be a plantation in Mississippi and they sustainably harvest every year and they sell off those pitchers. This operation is great. There are other sites where they go into state parks and people will steal those pitchers. It really makes me mad. White Top was poached to extinction in Georgia. The last population was found in 1987. Years later, 98, Atlanta Botanical Garden got a call and this fellow walking a power line right of way found these crazy white plants. Carol Denhoff drove really fast down I-75 and came down there. The site is still secret because the plants are still sought by poachers. Someone jumped the fence at the Atlanta Botanical Garden and took the Georgia leucos they propagated. They have thousands of pitcher plants there. 
but someone knew exactly, what, it's a collector's mentality, you gotta have whatever, every beanie baby, something like this, I don't know. <laughs> Porcelain goodle, but, um, so, which is, and so the poaching is ridiculous because it's really easy to grow pitcher plants from seed, and we have it all written up on the web, and these are in the trade. Back in the day, wetlands were viewed as wastelands, and people would dump their trash. Um, but these are things that hurt bogs more now, and I don't think people are like, ooh, pitcher plant bog, let's go mudding. I think people are out there having fun, they don't realize what's going on. Um, also, a lot of our pitcher plant bogs are in power line rights of way, and there are programs to help people plant trees back on their land, where you're given money to plant trees, plant longleaf pine, but they planted them in a pitcher plant bog. Oh, no, that didn't work out. This was a food plot uh, grant that was, and the food plot was put in right in one of the best bogs in Georgia. Aye. So don't think it's people going, oh, target the pitcher plants, kill them. It's just not people not knowing, so you gardening with pitcher plants, see, it's all good, it's all gonna help. These are plants that our grandmothers and grandfathers grew up with. They would have a pot of pitcher plants on their counter in their kitchen to catch flies. They were used and utilized and valued. They were on our roadsides, but you don't see them as much on roadsides anymore. Invasive, uh, invasive species like privet, we all know privet eats up bogs. Got to be careful with big equipment, although it's a lot of fun, um, in those soft soils. And some of these sites are just used in, used in a hard way. And there's so few left that we, we find them precious. But the, the roadside herbicide is hitting the last of our bogs because they have been surviving in these wet ditches. And I know in my career I used to see them driving south. I don't see them as much anymore. I think this is going to change in the next several years with a whole new awareness of pollinators. We're going to see a difference in Georgia roadsides. We're going to see the wildflowers come back. It's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. But this is where you find a lot of these pitcher plant bogs because why they want sun. So they're surviving in little refuges, refugia, and erosion would hurt and all these things would hurt. But you need to know that lots of wonderful things are happening for our natural bogs. The Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance is out there. It's all the sister gardens working together. We've been working to restore and safeguard bogs for 20 years, and we've had some crazy good success. Georgia is rocking conservation. <laughs> so, and we have people, and if you want to be a botanical guardian, if you want to help us just keep eye on, on some rare plant sites, we coordinate the botanical guardians like Hewitt and Martha. They live near a bog and they walk it and let us know how it's doing. And when the ATVs were in there, they let us know. And Georgia Power built fences for us and it was wonderful. Planting plants out, bolstering up populations. They are really easy to grow from seed and you can do this in your home. This is wonderful. Collecting the seeds in the fall. We've got it written up on the web. Bogs need to be burned. Deep Georgia DNR, they're wonderful. Look at that. You could do that on your property. It would be awesome. <laughs> monitoring, um, studying bogs and their diversity, lots of students doing work. Georgia Power is a great partner for a lot of our work with the Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance. Doing simple things like putting up fences and um, keep your ATVs out. And then you've got these lovely sites. Because what happens when you, if you're running over a soft soil? If the, bo if the water flows in a sheet in a natural bog, if you run a tire through there, you're going to channelize the bog. You're going to drain the lifeblood, right, out of the bog. The water's going in here instead of in a sheet, which is what you're creating. Are you paying attention? <laughs> this was a possum in my bathroom. <laughs> I know. I, it was a baby possum in my bathroom. It was the third one. There's a story about there. I know. That's just to make sure you're paying attention. Okay. So, how to build a bog. You have this in your notes. It is all written up. It's on the web, on this website called EPSN, not ESPN, EP, Endangered Plant Stewardship Network. So we have this, had this program where kids were, we were building bogs on school grounds, and kids are growing these. So it's all written up. These photos were taken by Hugh and Carol Norris. They're uh, professional photographers to tell you step by step. And there are also notes on this website for growing pitcher plants from seed, and we'll talk about sources. All right. What do we need to know about choosing the site? So this is a, this is a illustrated to you through a school ground project. What do you notice? Full sun. What else do you notice? This is not a place that's going to get runoff 
Um, you don't. This is a wetland, and you want the water to be very clean. You don't want water coming from rose bushes that you have to spray with chemicals or uh, runoff from a parking lot. Why? Pitcher plants are adapted to use the chemicals they absorb. They are carnivorous, insectivorous, and carnivorous because in their natural habitat, they can't get potassium nitrogen from the soil, so they eat that so that they can flower and produce seeds. So they're really good at chemicals. So you wouldn't fertilize your pitcher plant. You wouldn't want chemicals to come in there. Will it kill a pitcher plant right off? They are tough, long-lived perennials, but if you have sundews or bog orchids, those, are, those tend to wink out first. So no chemicals in your pitcher plant bog or in your pitcher plant bog garden pot. Is it making its way around? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's already back here. Okay. All right, full sun. When you're planning your site, um, it would be really nice to make a bog the size of this room, but maybe a bog the size of half that table would be sufficient. Remember, you you, you don't want to stand in the bog. You have your arms are only so long. So think about the size. We got ambitious and made a huge bog, and um, a small bog tells a great story. Five by seven is what our instructions are written up for. Full sun. Here they were doing the fighting war eagle bog, shaped like a war eagle with butterfly gardens as the wings. It was very elaborate. At the end, it looked like a circle. So, <laughs> so this is a, these are all in your notes. I hate this little yes. Get through that. Okay. So the things that you need: you need a pond liner. You can use a pool liner. You can use roofing liner. You need a plastic liner. Um, you're going to need peat moss and sand, and the peat moss is the milled sphagnum moss, and you buy it in bulk. Absorbs 15 times its weight in water, so stab that bag, put it in the rain, let it absorb. Because if you do what they did to me when I was a larval scientist, and Ron Biederman was like, oh, new kid on the block, you go make our bog mix. And I was like, sure, whatever you say, Ron. And I mixed it up, and what was I doing? I was blowing peat out my nose the rest of the day, right? So when the peat is dry, you might want to wear a dust mask until you get it wet. Just get that sucker wet before you even mess with it. Poke holes in it. So um, you need peat, you need sand, and in your notes it specifies river sand is best, not granite sand, too many nutrients, not play box sand, too fine. You want a chunky sand because you want spaces between the granules because the wicking of water through those spaces is what draws water through your bog. How about that? Little physics in action. That was the pantomime. A wicking of water. Okay, you need wheelbarrows, you need shovels, you need strong people. All right, the most important part of this is getting the slope right, uh, digging the hole right. So it's only 18 inches deep. All right, it's not a big, giant bucket of water. You also want to identify a high end and a low end because you're going to water from one end with a soaker hose. You want that water to go through in a sheet and you, it, the water's going to come out the other end. And we have tricks for catching that water. The slope that I'm talking about is one inch uh, drop every three feet. So you would have to push a marble to get it going. It's a very slight slope. Just that water, if you stood there and with a hose, water would start to flow. So if you're bog is 18 inches deep and it's six feet long, it's 18 inches on this side, it's 20 inches on that side. Did I do that math right? I think I did. Okay, so we're talking slight. You got this? Say yes, Jennifer. Yes. Oh, that feels so good. Okay. You want gently sloping sides, so not vertical. Certainly not like that. Not too far, just gently sloping. Getting that right is the hardest part. You take all the rocks out, take the roots out, because you don't want anything that's going to poke your pond liner. Here we had to call in UGA fraternity boys to dig up the bog. They were in trouble. They had to do community of service projects. <laughs> and they did. They were very well behaved in front of these elementary school kids. Um, because the school site, it was, you can imagine, it's the worst possible soil. Um, and it had spark plugs and insulation, all kinds of junk in there. So we had to get pickaxes in there. So hopefully your garden is not like this. Measure it 18 inches. You know, do the little tape measure with this. That's as deep as you want to go. You're going to want to take that clay, whatever you dig up, get it out of there. You don't want it washing back in. So go fill something else up somewhere else far, far away. You don't want it to, the rain to carry it back into your site. 
And don't put your bog at the bottom of a drain sprout off of a roof. We had a couple of schools do that, and their bog, the whole thing washed away in a storm, pond liner and all, <laughs> twice. You know, we got to do some observing and some intelligent tinkering and learning and moving forward. I know the site will work, I swear. Oh, dang, washed away again. All right, laying the liner. So you've got pond liner, roofing liner. Um, you know, you're going to have to buy a piece bigger than your hole and count, taking into account the slope, and you want lip hanging over the sides. All right? Try to, it's a round shape of some sort that you've made, so you're going to have to fold it and make it smooth, like you're just doing your best, best Martha Stewart tablecloth action, <laughs> laying it in there. All right? Here are kids in, um, high school kids in Madison building their bog beside their building. Here are little bitty kids, they're getting all in there to lay that pond liner. Don't cut the trim, because as the we fill the bog, it's going to get, it's going to pull that liner down, and we don't, we want the liner to hang out over the edges, okay? Filling the bog, the first 12 inches, so the whole bog is 18, the first 12 inches, the bottom of the bog is that river sand. Sand is heavy, you guys, so work in small loads, use wheelbarrows, bribe your friends, you know, let's have a mimosa bog building party. <laughs> well, you guys are going to think I'm some kind of wild woman. I'm not that wild, I'm just saying. You know, it's kind of fun. Okay, so you're going to put 12 inches of sand. You're going to smooth that sand. You're going to make, you're going to patty cake it, not stomp it, but patty cake it and make it smooth. And you're going to recreate that slope that you identified. You've got your high end and your low end. Your 18 inches of sand, 12 inches of sand. I don't know, it's you're going to redo that too in the bottom, okay? Yes, Jennifer. Yes, yes. Oh, I love it. Okay. Smoothing out the sand. You're using tools like shovels. Don't poke a hole in your pond liner. Been there. <laughs> Measure it. Make sure you're 12 inches. This is important because the, this is the base. This is the the um, what is it? What is it called? Our veins in our body. Circulatory system that's going to draw that water through and out to your bog. This is not a stagnant, rotting place. Then you're going to wet that sand in. You're going to wet it and wet it and wet it and wet it, and you're going to want to see water pooling on your low end. This is all written up in detail. <laughs> this is a big, muddy mess. So they, these kids used a pool liner that was donated, and then it rained and rained and rained, and the whole site with all those kids helping, because they had like 60 kids helping build this bog, there was just clay. Oh, these kids were such a mess. We, sending them home, it was great. <laughs> all right, so now the second part of filling the bog. This is your planting mix. It's peat and sand, that milled sphagnum moss, three parts peat to one part sand, river sand, Mix and mix and mix and wet, wet, wet. If you try to put it in there dry and water, it's going to float and go away. All right? You're going to fill it. You're going to mound it. You're going to mound it coming out of your bog. You're going to let it settle for 24 hours because it's so soaking, sopping wet. All right? Heat. It's milled sphagnum. Don't get it up your nose. Look at that little ratio action. Three parts peat, one part sand. Mixing on a liner is a good idea. Then just start shoveling it in there on top of your sand. Patty cake. Look, there's your pool liner. And then water it in. You're going to let it settle for 24 hours. Now this is the fun part. This is another party in your, in your bog garden. You're going to do the bog dance. So now this mix is so light. It is so... Um, light in, in weight has such light mass you need to pack it in so you're literally going to stomp on your bog you can do some singing some chanting whatever is your thing we've had kids do you know bog angels that's fun to get go home now in a mom's leather seat car that'd be good okay so but you have to do this you have to stomp and chant and sing and do a little I don't know um, some teachers put because the kids had to go back to class. They put bags on their feet. <laughs> That's a teacher that knows who's protecting her classroom. All right. 
Oh, and this logo at the bottom, that's a Little Richard Pitcher Plant. He's singing the Green Plant Blues. I got 50 ways to become endangered. You just step on my root, new, break off a limb, Jim. I don't remember the rest of the song. We had, um, Ann Shank has a whole puppetry thing with Little Richard Pitcher Plant singing the Green Plant Blues, and you can help Pitcher Plants by making these gardens. It's very cool. It's on the web. All right, now you need to secure your liner. So you've got this liner sticking out and it's exposed. You're going to need to cover that because any liner exposed to the sun will deteriorate and break down. Put some logs on there, maybe to sit upon. Put some rocks on there. That would be lovely. Would you put pressure treated wood on there? No. Because it'll leach into the bog. Would you put cement on there? No. Little stepping stones? No, because these are acidic sites. That peat is really acidic. These plants need acidic soil and if you put some cement, as my mother says, cement on there, it will leach the lime into the, and change the city of the bog and the plants will suffer. And they will suffer. Um, we've demonstrated it. Um, would you put railroad ties around your bog? Oh, y'all are so good. Good, okay. So get some rocks, some, something to sit upon. Um, and then you can also fill in a, around that edge with sand and cover up that pond liner. And then, because this pool liner that they used was, I don't even know, 100 feet wide for their 10 by 10 bog, they had to cut off the rest after they filled it. All right, this is the trick. How are you going to water this bog? And this is in your notes. It's on the web. You're going to put in a soaker hose across that top end. You're going to put it under the soil inside the pond liner you're going to have a quick connect to a hose so you you should put your bog somewhere near a, near a, a spigot i should have said that at the beginning we did have a school have to run like 500 feet of hoses their bog. so that water is going to come out that hose and run in a sheet and run out now how many times do you have to water a bog when these plants are established you will not need to water your bog unless we are in some kind of crazy drought like we were in a few years ago when your bog is new, newly planted, I would say three times a week, 20 minutes should do it to get those plants established. But once they're established, you can back way off. And then look at your soil. If it's starting to get real dry, you can water it like once a week until you see water coming out the bottom, and then you're good. Notice this is our drawing with the soaker hose coming down, and then at the bottom, you can build a well, and we'll talk about that. So here are the kids putting in their circos. Look at that ball of clay that kid is holding. That's my mouth. Yeah, don't throw that at your friend. And then um, you put a quick connect, because you're not going to always want this hose hooked up to a water source. You won't need it. So you can see the high school kids with their quick connect. So just the end is sticking out. The rest of that soaker hose is completely buried underneath the soil. And you hook your hose up, to turn it on 20 minutes, if it's like a 5 by 7 bog. This is the illustration for turning it on. <laughs> if you're working with teachers, though, that's a big deal because you have to have a key for some of these schools and museums. That you know, you're special if you have the watering key. <laughs> Building a well. If you do not want your water to flow out into your garden or your lawn, you can build a little well at the bottom where the, where you notice the water coming out. You're just going to build like a two foot deep hole, two by two, get a fence pole digger, and you're going to fill that sucker with rocks, and so water will have some place to flow instead of pooling. At our botanical garden, it goes into the Bermuda lawn, which I just think is fabulous. I have issues with Bermuda. <laughs> Bermuda's for soccer fields, not for, oh, habitat. Let's see, if you're building a bog and you um, are worried that something is going to wash into your into your bog. If you have other gardens up here and you fertilize and you don't want that to wash into your bog, you can build a trench to protect your bog on the upper slope. And this is again just a, like a little French drain you're going to dig out outside the pond liner, about one foot down and one foot across, and you're going to fill that with sand. So anything that's w flowing towards your bog can be caught there and won't go into the pond liner into the bog. Extra super precaution, usually not necessary. But here are the high school kids building their trench. They pulled the liner back. This is outside the top of their bog, just in case something flows in. And then they fill that trench with sand. And there's an illustration. It's in your notes. This is the fun part. Plant the bog. Now, 
you're going to be putting pitcher plants in your bog. Pitcher plants are so much fun to grow from seed, but if you get them from seedlings too, we're going to have to talk about where you get your seeds. They form pitchers right away. They're so cute. And you could even have a banana with uh, fruit flies and the, the pitchers will eat the fruit flies. It's so much fun. Do not put raw hamburger inside your pitcher plants. <laughs> Do they have to eat insects to survive? Do they have to? Are they green? Do they photosynthesize? Say yes, Jim. Yes. They photosynthesize. They don't have to eat. They eat because in their habitat they need that potassium nitrogen. They can't get it from the soil. And they must eat if they want to reproduce. This is a symbol for reproducing. This is flowering and fruit set. But they can photosynthesize just fine. So you don't have to feed them. But it's so much fun. But don't put raw hamburger in there. Okay. Um, one thing when put, planting pitcher plants, I'm not going to dig that one up. Like we were learning in the previous talk about the crown and the tree and how you want that crown at the surface, pitcher plants have a rhizome, a crown. So all the pitchers connect and there's a swelling and as the plant ages that becomes a nice big fat rhizome. And then the roots come off. That's a storage organ. So these plants can take drought, these plants can take fire and they come right back. No problem. But when they're young, they don't have so much. You want that crown right at the surface. You don't want the plant flopping too high. You don't want to bury it. You want it at the surface. All right? So, you, so when you get your pitcher plants from your ethical sources, you'll know how to plant them. And then they'll look fabulous. Know that when you take a pitcher plant out of a pot, it will triple in size, usually within the first year. They do not, it's like taking shoes off at the end of the day. They're like, oh. They do not want to be in that skinny pot. If you'll notice the pot display, if you're going to make a potted display, you want a wide pot more than necessarily deep. You're going to put gravel in the bottom and then the peat sand mix on top. And you're going to pack that peat sand mix in there. So you're mimicking the other bog that you're making in the ground. You can do that. You can do it in a whiskey barrel. But if you do it in a whiskey barrel, what do you have to do? Line it with plastic. Y'all are so smart. Yes. Um, could you do it in a cement planter? No. 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 Plastic is good. And other things are good, but they get real heavy. The, this is a real heavy mix, especially if you've got rocks in the bottom. You could use styrofoam bits, peanuts. That could work. Kind of a what, nice way to recycle and get rid of peanuts. That could work. Now, where in the world are you going to get your pitcher plants and your other bog associates? This is on our website. Um, this is really, really, really important because these plants are poached from the wild. And plants are only protected on state and federal land, so they're poached from botanical gardens. They're poached from private land without permission. They're poached from state parks and national parks, federal land. We like California. California carnivores. Now those won't those won't be southeast. Um, those are tissue culture plants. You should know. So it's it's a great way to get a lot of fast plants. There's not a lot of diversity in those individual plants. Niche gardens, fabulous, fabulous. There, North Carolina. You should go there sometime on a field trip. Wonderful place to get native plants and a great place for spring ephemerals. Plant delights nursery. So this is all on the web. You're oh, and Jennifer. Oh, and know that. Pitcher plants, you would have to order them on the web. <coughs> you will have to pay for them, all right? Because getting them is hard. I haven't been able to seed collect for like the last four years with that drought situation. We So the seed sources in Georgia are down right now. They weren't making seeds in the wild. If you have a friend who's got a bog and you collect seeds from them, what is the rule anytime you're collecting seeds anywhere? It's the 10% rule. Somebody said it. Love you. Thank you. We're friends now. Okay. She's like, too much lady. Back up. 10%. Never take ten, more than 10%. We follow those guidelines. It's, it's ethics. It's, you know, it's our ladybird. It's the way we, we roll. Okay. Plant Delights is wonderful. Niche Gardens, wonderful. And Plant Delights and Niche Gardens also, you should know, so there's nine species of pitcher plants and four different varieties named so far in Georgia. What's cool about Georgia bogs is we have more than one species in a single bog. And what do they do? 
they fool around. So you get crazy hybrids, and that's usually what the plant collectors are after, are those unusual hybrids. These guys have also made hybrids at Niche Gardens and Plant Delights, and you can get some really funky looking pitcher plants with like double flowering and crazy pitchers that and you try to figure out what species. If you plant different species, over time you will have hybrids in your bog garden. So you can name it yourself. Jennifer's eyelashes are wow, my wow. <laughs> now where else can you get pitcher plants and bog and wildflowers? Atlanta Botanical Garden, our sister garden, we have all the gardens, Callaway Gardens, we all work together. We're all really good friends. They have a plant sale and they do sell pitcher plants. The State Botanical Garden has a plant sale. And you must come October 1st, 1 through 3 and October 8 through 10. So it's over two weeks. All the money goes to conservation. All the money goes to working with the green industry to get growers growing these plants. We give seeds to growers because we can't produce enough. So it's called Blue Stems and Blue Jeans. It's a hoop and a half. It's a lot of fun. All of our plants from Athens are grown from Georgia seeds. All right, 97% are grown from Georgia seeds. We do order some things in from... North Creek Nurseries, but we're getting closer to 100%. Because we, why do we want to grow Georgia seeds? Do you know why? What's the big push? For coordinating with pollinators for the timing for the phenology of pollinators? Yes. There's a new federal mandate. All state and federal lands have to start doing right by pollinators. Not just butterflies. We're talking bees and wasps and all these fabulous, wonderful things. Now, to do that, they're going to have to change the way they put lands, uh, plants on the side, uh, put plants on the land, put manage plants on red sides, and they want Georgia species. So there's, so you're going to see a lot of growers in the next several years offering Georgia plants, Georgia species grown from Georgia seeds. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be great for the green industry. It's going to be a, a big money, um, money push, and there's going to be a lot of money coming down for this. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so blue stems and blue jeans, please come. It's so much fun. It's your botanical garden. And, um, and if you ever need plants, you can't find them, you can email me, and I, my information's in there, and I'll tell you where to go get those if it's a native plant. I'll say, I'll put it out to the growers that we know, say, who's got this what? And we'll tell you where to go get it, because we want to support our growers that are growing these native plants. All right, we have any questions? Do you have any questions about? Yeah, that's the end. Um, building a bog or getting plants or building a planter, yes? You know the spots where the bogs are protruded, there's no work to fall out of it? Do I have a what? Yeah, the slide where yes? the fall line. Yes, you know, the Ron Niederman's private bog on the fall line, yes. Oh my years, gosh. So he did not put in a pond liner there, I will say. He modified... It probably was, it's a wetland. It's a seep. He had a spring seep coming out in an open grassy meadow, and he put those plants in there. It was sandy soil, a little bit dark organic matter. So because he had that natural wetland, he put the plants in. It did not have Bermuda. It did not have any, it was um, more of a natural grassland. It is huge. It's way bigger than this room. It's a couple of acres. And it becomes self-sustaining. Those plants reseed because you, you let them. You, you don't burn off the seeds. You let them shatter in the fall, and then burn them in the winter, and then just on and on and on and on. Rod Niederman's garden on the fall line. That was probably that picture was taken. It was probably four years old. These plants flourish and bloom right away. And the wildflowers that grow with them, you can grow them from seed. The seeds are, most of these bog wildflowers are like dust, and you would just scatter them on top of the soil, and you'll have hundreds of these we call bog associates. They're really great. Yeah, so if you buy a planter from us, it'll have those bog <coughs> wildflowers. It's like a bog starter kit. So you've got some pitcher plants, you've got some wildflowers in there, and you're like, oh, that's tiny but you'll have hundreds of those wildflowers by the next year. So the point you're like, oh, you might have to be thinning them, which is why you want to make your bog just so big. Not You won't be thinning pitcher plants, but you'll be thinning the wildflowers, the meadow beauties. Yes? For years. That's been in that container for probably three years. They, You can bonsai anything, right? They don't want to be in there. They want to get out. This planter does stay in full sun. We use it as a tabletop decoration. 
this is very festive. Outside, it just gets rainwater. Um, if we notice it's getting dry, we'll, we'll soak it. And we'll, for pur purple pitcher plant, we right uh, we fill it with water, the pitchers with water because that's how it traps its prey. So does the chlorine, in the water? chlorine in the water is a great question. Should be fine. Should be fine. We did have a problem at the botanical garden because we have a well and we have a prairie, a natural prairie, coincidentally, at the botanical garden. And we have this weird, ultramafic, basic soil. And, they, and our future plants kept failing. And they said, we took sample to EP, who was it? The test your water in your soil? Extension. We took the a water sample to extension and they said, you know, your, your water would have to be ridiculously basic to influence your pitcher plants. It would have to be absurdly the wrong direction of the scale, like over 7.5. It was like 8.7. And it, our plants were failing because of that well water. That was That's a totally weird thing. You'd have to live in Rome or at the Botanical Garden where we have this weird relic prairie or maybe in North East Georgia to have that. That's very unusual. Well water is usually great. Rain water is ideal. City water is just fine because it's all acidic. There was, yes? Uh, your email. My email, it's not in there? Okay, so it's um, my name, uh, J-C-E-S-K-A, -E Jennifer Seska. It's a soft C like celebrate. I love that. Okay. Um, at U-G-A dot E-D-U. All our, um, if you forget, our pictures and our email addresses are on the State Botanical Garden website. We're really easy to track down. And we like questions, and it's our, we're public service and outreach, so ask, and we will help. Yes? Um, can I just say that around here we've got the door. Uh, oh, don't run! Yeah! Uh, so people Thank you for saying that. It is. Yeah. It's amazing the know over here. Yeah. So there are two tips. So near here is uh, Doe Run. Do Run Natural. It's got a new name. Natural Area. Doe Run Natural Wildlife Management Area. It's part of Georgia DNR. It's a state park. It's near Moultrie. And they burn it, and it's fabulous. And they've got three species of pitcher plant. They've got terrestrial orchids. They've got sundews, even the dew threads. And you can walk a trail through there. It's gorgeous, gorgeous. Between Doran and Moultrie. When's the best time to go to Doran Bog? Oh, now would be great. You'll start to see flowers. Um, but September is one of my favorite times to go. Spring is beautiful. You can see them in the... Um, in that national forest in the Panhandle of Florida. If you know people who own, you know, quail plantations, you can go see them there. But they're getting harder and harder to see. Turner Bog, Karen Rollins has played a, in this site, you played a large role in protecting that, right? That's actually been purchased and protected. <laughs> Exit 82 at Ash Ashburn, um, you know, and so we want to protect it too, though. You know, so we don't want a bunch of people tramping through there. So this is true. There will be organized tours of that, yes, ma'am. But it is right up on about 75. That's a great point. When we do public. research at our bogs, we we actually don't even take very many volunteers because that soft soil. We don't want to we don't want to kill the bog, and that's why Doe Run is so nice because they've got a trail, so you know you're not going to impact the bog. Such a cool place. Oh, it's a, it's question in the back? So Tur Green? I just want to oh. say the Turner Bog, ABAC owns that. It's not public. Don't find out where it is and go. Oh, it's a secret. <laughs> okay, I apologize. We keep the location of, of the bogs we work in secret, too, because of poachers. Green, yes. At, at, at Grand Bay, there's a trail there, and that's a huge bog at Grand Bay. Grand Bay, okay. Others? Yes? Oh, is that Karen Kay? Yeah, it was a group of citizens in Tiffin that got together and donated money and worked together. One of the uh, doctors here in Tiffin, Brett Wagonhorse, organized a bunch of stuff That's and right. talked to everybody. And, but for the pitcher plant bog in Turner County, yes. and, but going through ABAC, yes. they do have tours like with Georgia Botanical Society oh, or the Native Plant Society and stuff. So 
it is available to go just on a guided tour. Guided tour, which is the best way anyway. Yes. You guys have been great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.